Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? There we go. All right. Good to see you all. I think today's weather is going to improve slightly uh, compared to what it has been this past week. It's particularly if you like sun instead of rain. So uh, I'm looking forward to some sun today. I hope you are as well. Just a couple things I think I need to mention. One thing in particular, uh, and I will open it up and see if others would like to um, have some announcements or not. Um, you'll look in the back of your bulletin this morning, and you'll notice that after some discussion and taking into account the expressed wishes of the congregation at the annual meeting, and I won't read this whole thing, but uh, we're going to have a, a meeting with the main conference minister. Her name is Reverend Marissa Laviola. She's a very nice lady. I've met her and talked to her several times. And we're going to have a meeting with her to discuss um, our, our current position as members within the UCC as a congregation, as ch congregational church is a part of the United Church of Christ. Um, and you'll notice this is going to be June 20th at 6 p.m. June 20th at 6 p.m. So we hope that you can all attend. If not, it's going to be, as I understand this morning, a uh, live stream. So you can watch it live or obviously later you can watch it on a later date than when it won't be live, but you can watch it. So there's going to be a lot of proposals and talk there, and you can read this for yourself, but I just want to make sure that uh, you all are aware that June 20th is a very important date on our calendar. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? Just like Dahl mentioned to you that uh, Elizabeth, our friend Elizabeth, will be getting married this afternoon, and uh, just send your prayers to her. Uh, she's very nervous. <laughs> Hearing nothing else. You all join with me now in our call to worship this morning as we gather together to worship God. It comes from Psalm 33. Rejoice in God, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. String, sing to God a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. By the word of God, the heavens are made, and all their host by the breath of God's mouth. May we stand and celebrate God's creation by singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It's number eight in the Pilgrim Hymnal.
you all pray with me? Let us pray together this morning's invocation. O God of the morning and the evening hours, let your spirit come on us here gathered. This is the holy place where we, your people, call on you in faith, joining heart and voice in thanksgiving and praise to your name. Amen. come together to worship, to recognize the very presence of the living Christ spirit living in each of us, and we come together to share in that spirit. When the word sharing comes up, I think one of the words that comes to my heart is the word trust, which leads to that much kind of bigger version of the word trust, faith. And when we gather here, we come here with a sense of trust and faith, not only in our God, but in each other that we will do the work and will of each other, that we will do the work and will of God and God's church. And one of the ways that we do that, of course, is through giving and sharing of the resources that God has blessed us with. There is a deep sense 
and trust that we need to be aware of what we give and share of ourselves or our resources, that it will be used and appreciated in a deep sense of, uh, yes, even holiness that is around it as we connect to the church through what we give out of our personal purses and resources. And one of the things that is for certain is that the church uses those resources to the best of that church's ability. This church does. We give and we share of ourselves in many ways within the community, and you're a big part of why and how we do that. Through what you share of yourselves personally, your uh, abilities, your gifts, but also the gifts that God has given you monetarily. And we read of this in Scripture. Let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and give glory to your God who is in heaven. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for your treasures for yourself in heaven. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. All things come of you, O God, and of thine do we give back to you. In that spirit, may we have this morning's offering. For the generous and honest spirit, Lord, that you have placed inside each of us, that gives us a willingness to give and to share in your name, 
we give thanks today. We thank you for your most Holy Spirit, which generates within us a sense of love and care for others that draws us together to give and to share in your name. Bless these offerings that we return to your table, Lord. By your very hand, may they be multiplied and used for and through the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come, when they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Seshem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. The second reading this morning is from the Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall be your descendants, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old but when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do
what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us to who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This morning's gospel reading is taken from the gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 9 through 13, and then jumping over a bit to verses 18 through 26. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players And the crowd making commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the district. May God add God's blessing upon the hearing and the reading of these words. Please remain seated and let us sing together. All Things Bright and Beautiful, number 478 in the Pilgrim Hymnal.
Let us pray. O God, open us up to the possibility to trust, to build upon that trust to faith, to faith in you. May we learn to let go of our inhibitions and those obstacles and lean upon you in truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Like so many of the stories in the Bible, this week's stories of Abram, and Matthew, and the woman coming to just want to touch the fringe of Jesus' clothes to be made well, and the man running even after his child had died to seek out Jesus for help. And of course, Paul's words to the church in Rome, they're all about that wonderful word, faith. Faith is built upon ultimate trust. And this is one of the backbones and one of the locking, integrating pieces that brings us together each Sunday to worship God. Faith. Faith that is built through trust. One of the current emails that I get, or got rather, um, is a story of a wealthy man. And every time it is said that he picked up a penny, he would stop and pray. And when he was asked why he did this, he remarked, on the money it says, in God we trust. And that points out and reminds me that all things come from God. Kind of a basic story, but one that kind of struck me in its kind of sincerity. Someone being reminded of the important to trust from a simple coin. It sounds like something from a, from a biblical story or, or some words of Jesus' teaching. The main text this morning, or at least the Old Testament text this morning, is about a man who illustrates the ability to trust, to build faith out of trust, to trust in God when told to make a big change, to move to a new location. And why was that? Because it was God's plan. And that's a kind of a theme today as well, you'll notice. So much of trust is, is kind of relinquishing our plans, our stuff, and trusting in God's plan for us and in God's stuff. And that's hard to do sometimes, I know. But just for a moment, let's think about, let's think about Abram, who would later be known as Abraham. Um, Let's contemporize and, and, and personalize his story for just a minute. I was thinking about this this past week. What would it be like for Abram to relocate if God told him to do so today? So you know this part of the story. Uh, my, Abram is just kind of minding his business, and suddenly God speaks to him and says, Get up and go. You need to go. I've got plans for you. Drop what you're doing. Drop all this stuff you're doing. Drop your, your personal life, and you need to get up and go. So think about it this way, kind of a Simon Says thing. I tried this with my daughters this past week, a Simon Says thing. So if, if God says to you, resign your job. I don't care what you get for a job. I don't care how much you like it, really. Resign your job. What are the implications and the feelings you feel in having to do that? Resigning your job. Now, some maybe of you said I would say, "Well, I wish somebody would tell me that because I'm really not thrilled with my job." But probably most of you would think, "Gee, you know, that's that's kind of radical." But God says to do it, or God says this. How about this? God says, "Sell your house. Sell your house." What are the implications and feelings of selling your house? Now, well, again, some of you might be thinking about that, but I'm, my guess is that most of you aren't really thinking about selling your house, or to move. God says to you, I want you to move now to, uh, and, and, and you can fill in the blank, perhaps the least desirable location you would want to go. God says, go and go to that least desirable location. That's where I want you to go. What are the implications of feeling and the feelings of moving to a place like that? Would you do it? Abram faced all of this at 75 years old, according to the Genesis story in chapter 11. God told him to relocate. Why? 
Again, God had a plan. God had a plan for Abram, just as God has a plan for each of us. And a lot of times, God's plan isn't exactly connected to what we want. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, that's, that's nice, Nate. Uh, that's nice, but why should Abram follow God and do what God asks? Why should we do that? Well, let's think about Abram for a minute, God's plan for Abram. What was it about? Well, it was fatherhood. Father's Day is coming right up for most of us dads. I'm thinking about that. God says to Abraham, I will cause you to become the father of a great nation. Now, you can imagine how Abram felt about that. Can you recall, if you're a dad, can you recall, I, I was thinking about this as, as well this week as I, I thought about Father's Day creeping around the corner, the feelings. Can you recall the feelings you had when you found out that you were going to be a dad? That moment when you said, oh, wow. For the first time, I'm going to be a father. A very interesting job, isn't it? Uh, I saw a t-shirt the other day. I, I've just got to get it. And it said on it, it said, where's this effect? It said, um, nothing scares me, nothing bothers me. I have three daughters. I agree. I, I agree with that, <laughs> as I have three daughters, as you all know. And I remember when I first found out that I was going to be dad, it took me a while to kind of get used to what that meant. I was quite young at the time, and I had to get used to the reality of becoming a father, what that would mean. Now, I'm, I'm not really sure what kind of an impact my role as a father has made, but I know I have some desires and some wishes that I would like that impact to have made. And I pray, of course, that it will be the right kind of impact when I think about my daughters, and I'm sure you all feel that way as well, whether you're a mom or a dad or maybe have children in your life. I want my children to grow up and be responsible and respectable people and perhaps above all things to be happy. Now this was a kind of a different situation for Abram. He knew before he was going to be a father that he was going to be a father, that God was going to make him the father of a great nation. And we're not just talking two or three kids here, right? I mean, and the end result, as we understand through our faith, Abram was responsible for a great nation, the nation of Israel. But he was 75 years old. Now, many of us in the church, we think, well, you know, I've done my work. We started getting up in age a little bit. I've done all I need to do. You know, it's time for that younger person to step up. Well, there's a couple things there. First of all, there aren't a whole lot of younger ones to step up. That's number one you need to realize. And number two, just because you're old doesn't count you out. Your experience, your wisdom, your knowledge, your abilities, they're still vital. Maybe perhaps more vital than ever within the church. But Abram was 75 years old. How could it be possible that he was going to have some children. He was not even the father of one child, let alone a great nation. But again, God had this plan, this plan that just seems so kind of unbelievable. And that plan included Abram. So as we read in Genesis 12, verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed him. He just started out. Now, we don't know all the details. I don't know how suddenly he took off. We really don't know that. We just know that that he just did what God had asked him to do. And then moving on to verse 5, he says, And finally, finally, he arrives at Canaan. Abram trusted God. He did not argue with God. He did what God said to do. And perhaps if we were to break down God's instructions into one word for Abram, it was, you need to move. You need to move physically, you need to move your family, you need to do something. God's plan usually involves us moving, now, not necessarily moving our homes, but we, ourselves, moving, participating, doing things. It requires us, our faith requires us to move, just as it did Abram so long ago. So, so why is this so hard? Why is it hard to think about some of those things I shared with you, you know, sell your house, quit your job, if God wants you to do this. It makes it hard, and it is hard, to trust sometimes in today's world. There's things like fear of the unknown, 
and past circumstances and experiences that influence us, influence us, and the desire to be in control. We want to be in control of our lives. We want to have agency. We want to be the person who dictates our life. I saw a show about the brain on PBS the other night. How many of you saw this? Fascinating. And a big part of the unconscious brain, as I understood from, from, watching, this, from watching this program, was that there's a real question or not of how much agency we actually have in, in, in dictating our lives. And we really think we have all this agency, but there's this kind of unconscious pieces of our brain that dictate stuff to us that we don't even know about. I mean, not just swallowing food or, or things like that. There's a part of our brain that just kind of controls us in a way that's kind of unconscious. And I won't go into all the details. It was a wonderful show. But again, this, this is kind of what this goes to. We think we have all this control of our lives, but physically and certainly spiritually, we really don't. And what's the best thing to do? Well, to follow someone who does have the plan, who does know what's going on. And that someone, that something, that incredible entity, of course, is God. And God's plan included Abram. And he got up and he moved, and he finally got to Canaan. But it's hard to trust, isn't it? But we can do it. We can do it. Years ago, a man named James Eads, he built the first steel bridge in America, and I don't know how many of you know this about this, but he spanned the Mississippi River at St. Louis, Missouri. And at that time, no one believed that it would support its own weight. They thought, no way, this isn't going to work. But Eads, he had, a, he had great faith in this plan. So what did he do? He ordered 14 locomotives to stop on the bridge at the same time. 14 of them to stop on the bridge at the same time. And of course, the bridge held. And at that point, the people trusted the integrity of the bridge. But the, the real kind of part of the story that interests me, and I think should interest all of us, that the builder already had the faith that it was going to work. He knew it was going to work. He knew it was going to stand. He had the faith and the trust in his abilities, dare I say, his God-given abilities to do this work and make it work. And God has a plan for you and I. God has a plan for you. And like Abraham, it requires us to walk by faith and not by sight. That's the, that's the catch, isn't it? That's what we're told. We have to just put our faith and trust in God and get up and move. God's plan for us as a congregation, as well as as individuals, goes beyond our own circumstances and surroundings, about our little worlds that we live in, when Jesus told the twelve in the opening chapter of Acts to be witnesses, his map included the whole world. Where do we fit into this massive plan? Well, the good news is that we do. And also part of the good news is that we don't have to uh, uh, entice the entire world to our faith or be a part of the entire world as a whole. Just go where God directs you to go. We are asked to go to places where God asks us to be. And many times... That's right here for many of you in Augusta, Maine, or Winthrop, or wherever you may be, Norwich Walk. And we have to have trust that God will put us in that place where our work will be best used and, and understood. Charles Reed, the English novelist and dramatist, he wrote, Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. God had a plan, and this plan involved not only God's personhood in, in Abraham and Abraham doing his work, but it also worked through him into the lives of other people, as we understand. And that's what our work leads us to be and do as well. God has a plan for us. And that plan may involve a move or a change that might seem ridiculous or even outrageous sometimes. Remember that, that sign, the sign that says, if God seems away or far away, guess who moved? What's the normal conclusion for this saying? We've wandered away from God, correct? But what if God seems far away because God is on the move and is waiting for us to catch up? Hmm, that's an interesting possibility, isn't it? 
Think about Jesus for a moment, his, his ministry, his movement. When he called Peter and James and John and the rest of the disciples, what did he say? He said, follow me. To follow means exactly that, follow. Not stay still, not wait, but move out. To move. To step. To act in the world. This is part of, we know, the plan that God has for each of us. How that works out, I'm not sure, but I know it requires us to act and to move in the world. God's waiting for us. God's looking for us. God has a plan for us that requires us to be on the move as God directs us to move. And we don't know where that is often, and so we have to trust God to lead us. You know, I'd love to be able to stand up here to you all and have this incredible power to say, this is what God wants you to do in your life. I have no clue. Only you do, and of course God knows. But we've got to search that out. That's part of the journey, isn't it? That's part of the movement, is looking towards what God has in store for each of us to do and to put our trust in it. God has a plan for us that requires us to be on the move as God directs, and we don't know where that is, so we trust God to lead us. The question you need to ask yourselves, each one of you, as I do myself, is what is inhibiting that trust? What is keeping you from that trust? And God not only has a plan for us, God has a plan through us. And that plan is to use us, I understand, to bring others, to share others in faith and love and trust in a similar way that Jesus did with each of us. Think about it for a moment, perhaps someone you invited to church or someone that you sat down with and you explained your faith to them about Jesus Christ. Do you remember them? Do you remember what that felt like? What was it about them that caused you to open up to talk about that or maybe to invite them to church? What was that? What was moving in you? Was it just your thoughts? Was it just you? Part of God's plan through them was your salvation, was your faith, was your belief in the importance of your faith and being willing to share it. What are the things that grows from our belief in God is our faith, and it develops as we trust and follow the Lord through both the good and the bad and the hard and the easy moments of life. But this journey requires trust in and of God. So I'll leave you once more with this question. What's inhibiting your trust, if anything? What is keeping you from fully trusting in God? Something to think about this week. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer, in which we in faith and trust lift up our thoughts and our needs, to God, I would draw your attention to the back of your bulletins this morning under the prayer requests as we continue to pray for the Kumler family, for Maddie, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, for Stephanie, for Diane, for Maria, for those seeking shelter or a home, we continue to pray for them, for the Green Street Methodist Church, our brothers and sisters uh, down the road here are really in a time of transition, a time in which God has asked them to move, frankly. Uh, we pray for Sue and Paul and his family, for Nancy and for Linda Brown, and, and I know Sue is here today, and our prayers and thoughts have continued to be with you, Sue, and will be as you go through this time of great change, as well as sadness in your life. And I would just ask if there are others to pray for, joys or concerns to lift up. Naira, yes. Thank you. We'll pray today for Stephen, who is facing a diagnosis of cancer. Others this morning? Yes, please. Pat. Yes, we pray for Robert, uh, as we have in the past, for his, his addictions and the, the struggles he's having with addictions, like so many other people are. But today we pray for Robert particularly. Are there others? Yes, Jim. Is 
Leslie and Rhonda. We pray today for Leslie and Rhonda going through some difficult times. Are there others? Yes, sir. We pray for Zach today and for guidance. Any others? If not, let us come together in a few moments of silence. Let us pray together and let us experience God's love through our faith. Let us pray. Lord our God, you know who we are. We are people, we are your creations. People with good consciences and with bad. Persons who are content and those who are discontent. We are people who represent the certain and the uncertain. We are Christians by conviction and Christians by convention. Many of us here are those who believe, those who have half belief, and even those who disbelieve. And you know where we come from, from the circles of relatives, acquaintances, and friends. Some of us come here just out of great loneliness. We come together from lives of quiet prosperity. and Some of us are here from confusion and experiencing great distress. We come from family relationships that are well-ordered or from disordered or those who are under stress within their families. We come from the inner circle of this Christian community and many of us come from its extreme outer edges. But now, God, now we all are here before you in all of our differences, but yet so alike. Alike in that we are all in the wrong with you and with one another quite often. And we come here asking for forgiveness and help and the building of our trust and faith in you and in others. We would be lost without your grace, Lord. We understand that. And we need to understand through the promise that that grace is made available to us all in your dear son, Jesus Christ. And we are here together in order to praise you. To praise you by letting you speak to us and through us. We beseech you to grant that this may take place in this time. God, confront us in this time of worship. Confront us with the fears that we hold so tightly, perhaps the favorite sins that we cling to so closely. Confront us with our closed-mindedness. Knock at all the locked doors in our hearts. Do not let us rest until you gain entrance. Lord, even tell us, as difficult as that might be, about the painful painful truths about ourselves that we might be willing to change, that we might be able to change, that we might receive the truth of Christ, the very truth that we are told and understood since long ago in our faith, a truth that will set us free. We do pray today for the needs of those within our community, those who are struggling, those who are confronted with so much that is so difficult. We thank you for the the wonderful blessings and the miracles perhaps that have happened in our lives this week. Again, in all of our differences and diversity, we are here, Lord, and we seek you. Bless us, God, and bless our community, and bless those who we reach out to you today through in prayer. As we hear the words of Christ to called people like Matthew, people like Paul, people like Peter and John. 
we recognize that Jesus calls to us. Lord, in our faith, may we hear his call today. May that direct us in whatever direction that we have the tra trust and faith to follow in through your very words and through your spirit. Teach us to trust. Teach us to have faith. We remember now the words of Jesus Christ when he taught us to pray in faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we close today's service, again, remembering of God's great creative ability and how that creation is a part of our lives, let's sing together for the beauty of the earth. It's number 66 in the Pilgrim Hymnal.
as we leave today. Let us leave in the fullness of the love and the grace that God shares with us as we gather as one in his name. Let us live our faith. Let us move in our faith. Let us act upon our faith as God would direct us. Go in peace, my friends. Amen.